Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Philadelphia Public Health Grand Rounds um, at the College of Physicians. Where to go from here? Firearm injury prevention in Pennsylvania. I'm so thrilled that you've been able to join us, and I think um, we will have a tremendous discussion tonight about uh, firearm injuries and gun violence in our community um, through the lens of different disciplines of public health, um, all working to address this issue. I'm Priya Maman. I'm the uh, chair of the section of public health um, at the College of Physicians. And for anyone who hasn't been with us in the past, um, Public Health Grand Grounds was really a program we designed to bring important public health issues um, to the forefront. We choose local speakers and we make sure um, to highlight the multiple disciplines that are all working together to address a problem um, that we're facing in our community. And our hope is that this will be a platform in which we can generate new ideas and collaborations um, and really um, sort of pivot off of the role of the College of Physicians and the section as being sort of in the middle of everything and able to bring together a wide variety of um, experts, community members, and everybody who's interested um, in public health issues of our time. Um, I'd like to thank the Independence Foundation for their generous support of this program, um, and of course the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. We will have a panel presentation with the experts. Um, following the panel presentation, um, we will have a Q&A. So please um, join us in bringing your questions um, to the table. There will be a chat as well as a Q&A box. Um, the chat will be open during the discussion as well. Um, and the Q&A, uh, we will be presenting uh, the questions to our panelists. And finally, please join us on the section. Uh, we welcome all members, um, and it really is a phenomenal group of doers um, really across the spectrum of the public health world um, in Philadelphia. So please join us. We'd love to have you. Um, we have uh, several institutional sponsors as well of the section, all of the academic um, schools of public health and divisions of public health in the region, um, and we collaborate all together. And so now I am thrilled to be able to introduce Dr. Kristen Rexing as our moderator for this session. Dr. Rexing is an assistant professor at the Department of Urban Public Health and Nutrition at LaSalle University. Her research uh, interests revolve around uh, gun policy, and so she is the perfect person to guide us through this discussion tonight. And with that, I thank you again. And uh, Dr. Rexing, please take over. Hi everyone, welcome. We are so excited to have you here for what will surely be a very informative and lively panel discussion regarding the gun violence crisis that is facing um, our Commonwealth. Just as a refresher for our audience, since I know that we bring in many people from across the city and the surrounding areas, some with a public health background and some with not, um, a quick refresher that Public health is really a science for reducing and preventing injury, illness, and death, and promoting health and well being among populations through the use of data, research, and effective practices and policies. And how do we address this public health problem? Um, we address it like many others, where we come together with a wide ranging group of expertise to determine what the problem is, identify key risk factors develop evidence-based policies and programs and ensure effective implementation and evaluation of those. And because the goal is widespread adoption of these strategies, as with everything else in public health, it is inherently a political issue and process because we're determining allocation of resources and uh, policies that will have the best outcome for the largest group. So when we look at this crisis, much like many other crises, it requires engagement across sectors to try and bring in the best backgrounds um, and solutions. Every day, um, you know, when we're thinking about identifying this problem and defining it, you know, it's very clear we lose 100 Americans every day to gun violence. And whether it be from the mass shootings or community violence that we see largely on television or suicide that is not often talked about, uh, the problem is on the rise. And this is what those slides are showing that this is growing and growing. And I'm sure that our audience is aware of that issue. 
more Pennsylvanians are dying from gun deaths than motor vehicle related crashes. And these deaths are, again, preventable deaths through the science of public health. And if you're watching the news, oftentimes the story lacks the dimension of how gun violence is not just a Philadelphia problem, but it is a Pennsylvania problem. And those stories lack the dimensions around all of the crises that are facing every Pennsylvanian. Um, and when we are thinking about this epidemic of homicide and suicide across the Commonwealth, the common denominator is access to lethal means. We see that where more guns are, there are more deaths. Um, and when we were thinking about this crisis, we need to be thinking holistically. During the COVID-19 crisis, we've seen an increase of gun sales, and these are non-expendable goods that, um, you know, once they're out and they're circulating, they do not go away. And so we need to be thinking about how to face this. So both as a country and a whole, and specifically in Pennsylvania, where we've seen large increases in gun sales, this is a crisis that we'll be facing um, moving forward. And our gun problem within the Commonwealth becomes everyone else's gun problems. We harm those within our borders. Um, guns within our borders harm other people. And so again, we need to really be thinking uh, creatively, evidence-based to address this issue. I'm going to end on this slide where we think about the public health impact pyramid. The goal of public health and our public health approach is really to remove the burden from the individual through changing the context in which individuals and communities live in healthy and safe spaces. Um, so we've brought together an amazing panel for you to talk across the practice of public health within our communities, uh, within our Commonwealth to address this issue. So tonight you're going to hear from a great panel of speakers who are going to talk about what we are doing within Pennsylvania to create change. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our panel for you this evening. We've got Dr. Ruth Abaya, she's the program manager for the injury prevention program at the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. We have Dr. Eleanor Kaufman, who is assistant professor of surgery in the division of traumatology, surgical care, um, and emergency medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. We have Dr. Michelle Kondo, who is a researcher and social scientist with the USDA Forest Service. We have Mr. Khalif Mujahidi Ali, who is the CEO and founder of Beloved Care Project. And we have Mr. Adam Garber, who is the executive director of Ceasefire PA. So you're going to be hearing from a great host of panelists this evening. Um, and we look forward to your discussions. Make sure that you, or your questions, make sure you add them to the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll get to them at the end. Good evening. So thank you so much for the invitation, for the opportunity to speak on this topic. Um, we know that this is on the forefront of a number of people's minds, um, and this is an issue that affects all of us. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the city landscape and also a little bit about what the city is doing and where we think a public health approach has the most potential to be effective. So I wanted to show this to kind of put it in the national context, which Dr. Rexing just did, specifically the fact that this is an issue that the whole country is grappling with at the moment. And these are some of the headlines from the last year or so outlining how critical the gun violence issue remains. Um, but the one that I wanted to draw your attention to, if you go back one, um, is one from our own Philadelphia Inquirer outlining that at a point in time, um, victims of gun violence were more common than patients with heart attacks in one of our local emergency departments. And so um, uh, the sense of urgency that we all feel about this, I think, is warranted. So one of the ways that we attempt to measure the impact of um, firearm violence on our city is to try to actually provide publicly available data on where we're seeing injury. So we launch, launched an injury prevention dashboard in February of this year aimed at specifically providing data um, around gun violence and where we're seeing it, who it's affecting, things that we all know, but we often really never had a central resource to describe. And that's all in the name of having a more data-driven approach more broadly. Um, so what we did on our, dash, on our dashboard is we actually started with the social determinants of health. And that was a very intentional decision because we believe that there's a foundational aspect to what is going on in the communities where we see recurrent um, high levels of violence. There are other things that are true about those communities. And if we're going to take um, the, the approach that Dr. Rexing outlined, which specifically focuses on the health impact pyramid and the need to focus on the base of that pyramid to really substantively change public health issues, ultimately we need to think about the social determinants. And so this is just one of the examples 
examples. And what it demonstrates is um, how poverty overlaps with shooting victims in location, just geolocates in similar locations in Philadelphia. And this is true for a number of other social determinants like employment or the presence of opportunity youth um, or educational attainment. And so we need to think a little bit more about what is driving these issues and what's true about the locations in which we're seeing high numbers of shootings before we're able to affect the problem. So this is just another way of looking at that same issue, focusing on one particular um, item, which is unemployment, specifically what's defined as chronic male unemployment. So unemployment in, in individuals 16 to 64 who are males, and this is defined, chronic is defined as no employment in the preceding 12 months. And what you can see here is that these things, again, co-locate with violence. And so the regions of the city where, th where both of these things are high, where there are both high numbers of individuals who um, have been chronically unemployed and there are high numbers of shootings overlap. And so the question I think public health has to ask itself is how do we start to go downstream and really think about what's creating these, these systems of, of disadvantage and how that's manifesting as violence rather than waiting until violence occurs to respond. So this is also from our dashboard. And what this demonstrates is, is a little bit of what we've been seeing over the last few years. And so this is data through just August of this year uh, and October has been, when you look at it through October, which is the most recent time that we've pulled it, you can see that the trends have been fairly similar. What's notable about this is that um, cumulative numbers in 2019 and in 2020 started off different. So 2020 started in January worse than the preceding January. But however, as you can see that the effects of the pandemic started to take place. So after March, um, as the pandemic itself and its after effects really started to take hold, those lines became widely divergent. And that's where you really start to see violence took off. And then January of 2021, we really started off in a significantly worse place and for the most part maintained that trend. Where we are now is that we're um, close to the highest number of homicides that we've seen in reported history in Philadelphia. Certainly we haven't seen um, greater than 500 since I think 1990 or the early 1990s. So it has been a very long time since we've seen these numbers and that's overall homicides, not just firearm homicides, but many of you are aware, firearms drive the majority of homicides in, in Philadelphia. Um, and so ultimately, this is just an overall uh, view of kind of where, where we've been and how things kind of took a turn for the worse right when the pandemic started to take hold. I also wanted to draw your attention um, to the figure on the bottom right, which shows the kind of stark and really disturbing racial disparity that we know is associated with firearm violence in our city. So we know that there's a disparity nationwide when it comes specifically to homicides. We know that there's an issue around um, how this problem has been described and managed in the past and what tools have been used um, to, to address it. Um, but overwhelmingly, the victims of uh, shootings in Philadelphia, and this is non-fatal and fatal uh, incidents, are non-Hispanic Black individuals by a lot. And so there, this is definitely a racial equity issue as well. And it, we need to address the degree to which racism itself is a public health issue and it manifests as exacerbating all these other public health issues. So this is just showing the same disparity looking at rates in particular. And so whether you're looking at non-fatal shootings, which is the figure on the left or homicides, which is the figure on the right, both of those are, are have market disparities and non-Hispanic black males overwhelmingly um, see this particular public health problem more than any other group. So this is looking at another aspect of, of, of um, firearm injury, and it's worth noting this particular aspect, especially in the current context. So we all know that emergency departments have been very heavily burdened in the setting of COVID-19. We also know that there are a number of other health issues that we expected to worsen as people avoided medical settings in the context of COVID and as medical services became less available to communities that already had um, a decreased availability to medical resources. And so this just shows you what, um, what emergency department visits have looked like specific to firearm related injuries in the past several years. And in 2020, in the exact same time frame that we saw shootings go up in general, we saw ER visits also go up with some month to month variability. Um, 2021 has been a little bit more stable, um, but we continue to see that overall there's a significant burden um, on our local emergency departments. And that has significant implications for the management of other diseases, for resource utilization, for the types of resources that are available to these individuals upon leaving the emergency department, et cetera. And it also has, um, to put a positive spin on it, it also has implications for um, preventative options and ways that we can at least do some secondary and tertiary prevention to prevent subsequent re-injuries um, and also significant mental health effects for people who are victims of firearm violence.
So I wanted to draw out just a couple of populations to talk about because I, there has been a lot of conversation, I think, around both women and children and the increase in violence in those populations. It's worth noting that there's no, um, there's no population for whom this, this is acceptable. Um, but I do wanna note that we're seeing changes in what types of violence are occurring. And we're seeing that those seem to have been affected by the pandemic as well. So if you look at um, shooting incidents among women in Philadelphia, similarly, a couple months after the pandemic took hold as the public health measures and necessary public health measures to control the pandemic were put in place, you can see that there was an uptick in violence against women specifically around sh um, shooting incidents and that that elevation has been maintained in the current year. You can see similar trends for children. So that diversion of the lines in children occurred much sooner um, in 2020, but you can see that that's again been maintained in 2021. And so ultimately, I think this really speaks to the need to really go further down the line and think about the core preventative strategies that would empower communities where violence occurs at, at, at high levels, um, because the manifestation is really very broad. But we are seeing also that the nature of violence is changing, and that requires, I think, new and innovative strategies to, to solve it. I wanted to take a moment to speak about the lasting harm that we anticipate that this is doing in our communities. And there um, are those who are coming after me who will speak much more to this. But um, here in Philadelphia, there's been some work done to look at how this is manifesting, both in children and adults. Um, and one of the things that's really notable, I'll start by talking about a national trend, Nationally, it was noted that mental health related visits for children in particular, the percentage of them or the proportion of them that were mental health related went up. In other words, kids in general were not going to ER visits as much during the pandemic, the per but the percent of ER visits that were mental health related went up in that time period by a significant amount. Um, and that I think goes hand in hand with the next piece of data, which is that living near shooting incidents in Philadelphia, this research was done in Philadelphia, increases mental health ED visits for both children and adults. And so, you know, we focus on the people who are killed and the people who are injured, and we need to do that. But there are significant ripple effects, and those are also relevant to the cause of public health. And so we need to talk about the full universe of, of compromised health that is, that is generated by firearm injury um, when we talk about this problem. What I had just mentioned is also linked to general health. So one of the things that we often advise patients in my, with my other hat on is we tell them that they should be engaging in physical activity for a number of health benefits that that's associated with. But what these maps show are incidents or, or zip codes that have high numbers of individuals that were shot near a public space. And so specifically victims that are shot within one city block of a school rec center or park by zip code in 2019 is what's shown on the left. And this probably looks familiar because when I showed you the social determinants map and the general kind of shooting victims map, these are the same zip codes. So these are places where residents are reporting low levels of access to safe outdoor spaces. So that may be in part because of violence, um, but you can imagine how that would affect health much more broadly, right? We know that physical activity and engagement with social, with neighbors and the development of social cohesion has significant benefits outside of just, you know, preserving one's, one's health and well-being from violence. And so if we are not um, promoting safe spaces, there are other effects of that that we need to be cognizant of. So I really love this image. This comes from the Bay Area Regional Health and Equities Initiative. And I think it really speaks to what we believe needs to happen as, as far as a public health approach to violence prevention. So I think historically, clinical medicine has absolutely been kind of on the right end of the spectrum. We focus on the disease and injury and we treat it. And sometimes we talk about the risk behavior. So sometimes we're kind of one rung up where we're going a little bit more proximal and thinking about what might have been, what risk behaviors might have been informing that disease and injury. But rare Early in clinical medicine, until I think recently, certainly in my training, have we really thought about the far left portion of this diagram, the social inequities that inform the institutional inequities, that inform the living conditions, that inform the risk behaviors that ultimately lead to the health conditions that we're treating. I think the same transformation is both necessary and, and happening in the world of public health, where we focused on the problem and maybe we've done a little bit of, of um, you know, public service announcement work around risk behaviors, but haven't necessarily thought about how we need to transform the institutions and think about the social inequities. It's understandable because that's harder work, but I think gun violence is a great way to kind of draw attention to the need for moving to the left of this diagram if we want to see change that can outlast the next pandemic and the next social stressor. So 
the public health framework is one that we're trying to apply to the city's work. And this is an example of something that we're trying to construct. We're trying to take the work that the city is doing in various sectors and in various agencies and plug it into an established kind of public health framework that helps us know where are we concentrating our efforts. And the goal, of course, is to concentrate as many of our efforts as possible in the pre-event space before anyone has gotten injured. What are the factors that we can mitigate so that injury doesn't happen? But we also need to make sure that we have adequate resources at the time of these events and after these events to respond to people who are affected by them. And so taking the work that the city is doing and reorienting ourselves to look at it this way is one of the roles that my program is trying to play to make sure that we're oriented around um, the values of public health. So this is just a, a brief summary of our work areas. And for the purposes of time, I'm not gonna dive deep into all of the things that we are hoping to work on. I'm happy to answer questions about that. But I think that ultimately um, a reorientation around a public health framework for addressing violence and its after effects is the kind of core value of our program and somewhere that the city is, um, is actively moving into. And I'm happy to take questions about that. Thank you so much. And I think I will hand it over to Dr. Kaufman. Um, thank you so much, um, and uh, it's uh, such a privilege and delight to be here um, and to be talking about this crucially important issue in, in an environment where we can say and we will say and we will repeat uh, that is gun violence is a public health problem, but where we actually don't really have to say that and where it's sort of taken for granted, um, and uh, to be on a panel with so many of my esteemed colleagues. So. Eleanor Kaufman, I'm a trauma surgeon at the University of Pennsylvania. So one of the things that I uh, feel like I, I can bring to uh, the conversation is some of the very sort of uh, concrete piece of concrete piece of this. And, and I'm going to talk about um, some broader impacts of firearm violence, but I'm going to talk about this first and say um, when we say that something is a public health problem, um, it's a health problem. And I'm on that right side of the diagram that just, that Ruth showed in much of my life, take trying my best to take care of people who are injured by firearms. Um, and we, we hear a little bit more about the people who die and every death related to gun violence is of course um, a human tragedy and a policy tragedy and a public health failing. But um, when it comes to community violence, um, this is our old numbers, but the proportions haven't changed. About three quarters of people uh, who are shot survive. And that's partly, I hope, due to the work of me and my colleagues and partly due to many other factors. Um, but we don't think enough, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more as we go on about, about those survivors and, and what this means for them. But I think also people sometimes ask, you know, why are we perseverating on guns? And why are we perseverating on gun violence? And there could be no guns in America and there would still be violence, right? People would still do bad things to one another. And for me, as a, as a surgeon uh, with my very concrete thinking, um, this other figure on the right uh, is why. Because when I am in the emergency department, one of the things, uh, one of the worst things that we hear when we get notified that a patient is coming in, a patient coming in uh, after a penetrating trauma, they're in arrest, right? They've, they've died en route to the hospital. And now our job is gonna be to try to bring them back to life and to try to make that death uh, transient. And, and so one of the most dramatic things that I do in my job is uh, something called a resuscitative thoracotomy. And, and the clinical details don't matter so much, but we, we do, um, it's, but we will open someone's chest clamp their aorta, massage their heart, try to control the bleeding inside their chest to try to bring them back to life. And it, it works sometimes. And when I hear that that person is coming in, all I want is a stab wound. All I'm hoping for when that person is on the way is that they were stabbed in the heart. Not that I want anyone to be stabbed in the heart, but you know what I'm saying. Because our chances of finding um, finding a problem we can fix when the weapon was a knife with a small point, then when the weapon is a bullet um, that travels through and destroys tissue, um, our chances of success are so much higher. And, and so we do have more stabbings every year in the United States. This may not be true in Philadelphia, but it is true broadly. Um, but, the, but the number of survivors is just astronomically higher. So that's kind of um, and you'll, you'll hear more about this from others, I'm sure, but, but this is what we mean when we say that although many people have 
guns in their home or carry guns with them in an attempt to protect themselves in a world that feels and is dangerous. The evidence shows us that, that firearms are associated with uh, the owner or the resident having a double risk of dying due to homicide, a three times risk of dying due to suicide, five times the risk of being shot by someone else uh, during an assault, and, and seven times the risk of, of an intimate partner homicide. And so all of these things, all of these assaults, all, all of the intimate partner violence um, might be present, whether the gun was present or not. But the consequences are really, really very different um, depending on the means. So for me, it's always, it's always a both and. It's always the root causes of violence and the conditions that set us up for these interactions. But it's also, can we get our people to survive violence so that we have a second chance to address those root causes? So that we have more time to work on the policy and to work on the social conditions and to work on the systemic racism. Can we just get our people to survive? And that's what brings me to, to the next thing I want to talk about, which is which is most patients do survive, but but how many really thrive? Like I told you about three in four patients survive, and this is just one example, but up to half of survivors have a major mental health consequence of their injury um, and develop depression or PTSD, which just goes to show us that the impacts on individuals are go beyond the physical stuff that I deal with. The emotional individuals are profound. And it's not just the individual, like Dr. Abaya was telling us, it's the community, um, those who are directly affected and those who are living in neighborhoods uh, that are changed by the presence of firearm violence. Um, it affects us all as a society because of the costs and the opportunity costs that we pay here. What we want when we see people injured and they come into us for treatment is we want them to get better. We want them to go back to being superheroes and having dance parties. Sometimes it takes a little longer, um, but some people never get there, right? Some people have long lasting mental or physical um, limitations. It's really difficult to quantify some of this. And, and this is a uh, had to uh, go to this Canadian study to try to get a sense of just the physical disability. So these are disability claims after firearm injury. So up to 10% in the first year and then 20% over the longer time frame of people with intentional firearm injuries are requiring disability support. And this is this is reflected in data from Philadelphia in which, which survivors were reporting, 65% um, of survivors are reporting worse physical health um, 55% worse mental health, physical function is worse, em emotional support is worse, and people are not able to participate in their usual social roles and activities, are not able to get back to their full lives um, with dance parties and superheroes the way we want. Another way of looking at, at this, of course, is in monetary terms. So each firearm fatality costs us as a society around $270,000, each injury around $50,000. This is medical cost, this is criminal legal cost, this is long-term medical care as well. Another way of thinking of this is, you know, by who's paying every day, um, the government, businesses, and families are, are contributing to these bills and this sort of unquantified but attempted to quantify losses in terms of pain and suffering um, that, that people are experiencing. One of the really leading public health scholars in this uh, field is our neighbor here uh, in Philadelphia is John Rich. Um, and if you haven't read this paper, which is maybe the short version, or his really wonderful book um, called Wrong Place, Wrong Time, I really encourage you to do so. They really frame the way that I try to think about these things and, and really foundational, I think. Um, but it, for this study, they, they, this was done in Boston, but it, it, I think the themes carry over the last 16 years and, um, and across space to say that when a person suffers a violent injury, um, it has these really profound effects. And, and they identified three major um, processes that lead to a disrupted sense of safety. People have symptoms of traumatic stress, with uh, about 60% of their, the people that they interviewed met full criteria for post-traumatic stress, but 100% had the symptom of hypervigilance. And hypervigilance is um, a particularly dangerous symptom, right? Because it, might, it leads you to um, perhaps engage in behaviors that are otherwise risky. Perhaps it, engage, it leads you to carry a weapon, to um, react more quickly to situations that are threatening, right? 
there's a lack of faith in police and institutions, and, and there's this need to um, regain a sense of self and regain a sense of a sense of respect. Um, all of these problems taken together uh, put patients at risk for incomplete recovery and for re-injury, which we and these are some of some of the details of the response. So people are carrying weapons, people are more likely to use uh, substances or use them in a different way to manage their symptoms. This kind of information, I think, should lead us to think broadly about what it means to recover from a firearm injury. Um, and, and there's many different ways that communities and providers can provide support uh, to recovering patients. But um, over the last uh, 20 years, one of the uh, mechanisms for this that has really grown is, the, is a network of hospital-based violence intervention programs. Um, because uh, those of us who take care of firearm injured patients and we, when we uh, get someone's heart restarted or it never stopped, but, we, but we're able to treat their injuries and we're able to get them out of the hospital and we pat ourselves on the back um, that our job is done, uh, we're not correct um, because of everything that I've been saying and, 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 and the many, many challenges that, that face people. So this is just a list of some of the services that people need and that um, hospital-based violence programs in this particular study were able to provide. Mental health care is one of the biggest, um, which is no surprise. Um, financial support in terms of victims of crime compensation, so support in terms of applying for jobs, getting back into school, housing challenges, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it really takes a very broad perspective to get people back to, um, to their full lives. But programs that do these kinds of comprehensive services help. Patients are less likely to be involved in violent crime or to be involved in the criminal justice system. They feel better, um, which is really the thing that, I don't know, matters to me the most. Um, but they also have decreased substance use and are less likely to be injured again, um, which I think helps all of us. So these programs don't have to be in hospitals, they often are, but I think thinking really, really broadly about um, not only what leads to violence, but what comes of it is essential um, to helping people and communities recover, which is what we want. And, I'll, and I will turn over the floor just to say that, that gun violence is, is violence and it's also guns and, it, and we can work on both and we have to work on both at the same time. Um, as Dr. Abaya talked about, the impact is pervasive, but it's, highly inequitable and highly correlated um, with the, the structural inequities in our society. The long-term outcomes are unknown, not completely known, not fully explored, but are not great. Um, but there's so much that we can do and it's a great time to be um, working in this area. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I, I'm Michelle Kondo and I'm a research social scientist and I work for the USDA Forest Service. I'm gonna talk with you today about some uh, place-based or nature-based strategies for uh, violence prevention in, in urban areas. So some of you may be wondering, what is the Forest Service uh, doing here, right? In this uh, Grand Rounds. And uh, I, I will say that, um, so, you know, our motto, my agency's motto is caring for the land and serving people uh, in general. So we are about managing and helping to manage and steward our environments uh, and natural resources for current and future generations. And in my work, I focus on urban land um, and I focus on public health outcomes. So I am uh, located at the Philadelphia Field Station and we're part of a larger network of urban field stations. So, you know, we're, and our research is, is focused on um, urban environments. So we're coming to recognize just how much place um, you know, matters uh, for, for our health. So as the saying goes, you know, our zip code is more powerful uh, than our genetic code often in determining our health. Um, and namely disparities in access to healthy environments is, is driving um, some really dire inequalities in, in our health and, and exposure to things like violence. I really like this, uh, this diagram uh, from Ana Diaz-Rue uh, at, at Drexel now. 
um, that really talks about that some of these broader structural forces, um, structural racism and segregation by race and, and socioeconomic uh, status, as well as resource inequalities, um, drive um, you know aspects of both of our neighborhood physical and social environments that affect our stress levels, our, our, our behaviors, uh, the way we go throughout our day, uh, which ultimately affect our health. And you are seeing this again. I love this, this health impact pyramid um, that you know, just reminds us that it's increasingly we are recognizing that it's, it's important you know, if we are wanting to make population level uh, structural changes, um, that we, it's important to pay attention to and perhaps modify and change if, if we can, the context in which individuals are living and making our just everyday default decisions. Uh, I've done some work in, in thinking about, you know, the state of research on uh, what difference can neighborhood interventions make on reducing violence. And I would say, you know, although this is a you know, tiny bit dated 2018 uh, now, and we're see seeing so much more um, that there is a need for a lot more <laughs> research, right, in this area. What I found is that there really is most consistent evidence um, comes from housing and I, I'm trying not to use this word anymore, blight remediation, but um, and, uh, re you know, changes to neighborhoods with high levels of vacancy and, and just historic disinvestment. Um, uh, so changes to both buildings like ha housing and, and the land um, and some evidence that reducing alcohol availability, improving street connectivity, and providing green um, housing. So you know, nature, trees, uh, green housing environments can reduce violent crimes. I wanna give you uh, just an example from my own uh, research and, and with my collaborators. Uh, I, I ask in much of my research, can urban place and nature-based interventions reduce violence and injury? And uh, this one that I'll share with you is around a, a vacant lot cleaning and greening intervention done here in Philadelphia. So uh, this, and, and this is the, the, the publication of uh, the main findings, but it was a randomized controlled trial, cluster randomized controlled trial that uh, you know, we published uh, back in, in 2018. And it was a five year study in which we, uh, we partnered with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society and their land care program. Um, I'm gonna show you some photos of, of what, what, the, what PHS does uh, and with their land care program. But um, we took about 600 vacant lots and we uh, split some of them were control lots and they remained vacant throughout uh, the study. The others were intervention lots that received this, uh, this treatment. Yeah, so here are some photos. Each vacant lot gets, uh, you know, trash remo removal and all, every, you know, everything is removed from the lot. Um, it gets a standard sort of, you know, grass and a couple of trees planted and then a permeable picket fence so people can walk through it, but it prevents the, some of the, the dumping that we see. So we, we have short dumping in Philadelphia. So you can see here that the, the vacant lots, both our intervention and control lots were very much scattered throughout the city and we controlled, we took uh, reports, police reports of, uh, of crimes um, and we compared, you know, before compared to after at the control lots compared to, uh, you know, our intervention lots, what, what changes did we see, you know, if any, uh, in in these crime in crimes, and we did find statistically si significant reductions in crime overall, uh, as well as uh, you know, and specifically in in gun violence, as well as some property crimes, nuisance crimes um, in neighborhoods below the poverty line. Uh, we also surveyed nearly 450 residents living near uh, both vacant and, and control lots. And looking at the survey data and thinking about and uh, you know how or why are we seeing this this reduction in, in violence, we found um, that people felt less 
less afraid, I'm sure they perhaps felt more safe in their neighborhoods, reduced perceptions of crime, of vandalism. They also reported significantly increased use of out, outdoor space for relaxing and socializing. So perhaps it was, um, you know, had something to do with sort of more presence um, and positive social interactions on the street. And we have also calculated return on investment uh, for, for this type of, of intervention. If, if we're looking at the return in, in terms of say, cost savings from, uh, you know, from both firearm and, and non-firearm violence, uh, you know, ranging from a hospital, you know, uh, and health healthcare costs uh, to uh, costs associated with, with courts and, um, and loss of livelihood and, and impacts, you know, to not just individuals, but families and communities. And we find, uh, we know that typical costs are around $1,600 for each vacant lot initially, and then on just under $200 per year in maintenance. So we calculated uh, that uh, return on investment is $26 in net benefits to taxpayers and over $300 to society at large for every dollar invested in, in this program. How do we think this works? So I've talked about it a little bit. There are so many theories coming from you know, criminology and, um, and sociology. So we have now busy streets theory, which as I, as I mentioned, um, this idea that more positive you know, presence and, and interaction and use uh, in, in the streets promotes, um, uh, can reduce violence. Broken, the broken windows theory, which I would distinguish from the broken windows theory of policing. Um, this, this broken, we're using broken windows here uh, just to uh, indicate that, you know, improving environments, even in small ways, can signal to, to people that environments are, are cared for and, um, and that there uh, you know, is, is positive, you know, there's, there's a tension on, on space and uh, it motivates people to perhaps act differently and <laughs> maybe in more positive ways. Um, and so this is another uh, theory. I like some of the breaking this cycle. I've been part of a group, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, under direction of Kristen Mari uh, and her Project Vital or Vacant Lot Improvements to Transform Adolescent Lives. Uh, we have developed together a greening theory of change and you can't see any of these, these words here, but um, basically, uh, you know, both, it, we say, we're saying that both local and macro sort of structural forces are a backdrop for a wider range of, of greeting activities that are going on in neighborhoods um, in Philadelphia and there in Baltimore, such as gardening, um, arts, and other beautification, just mowing, workforce development, which can improve our, our, our dignity, our sense of purpose, um, our mental health, our relationships with one another in our environments and thereby lead to both short and long-term um, benefits. Uh, violence prevention, hopefully being one of them. And so the question is that, that I and, and others are you know, trying to, you know, the next step obviously is how can these types of interventions become part of healthcare investment and practice? Uh, and um, it takes, uh, and will it is taking and will take more collaboration um, you know, across sectors and with, with cities and, and uh, non nonprofit groups. I'd love to hear your ideas. And um, so I'm gonna pass it on now, I believe to Khalif. Hi everybody. Um, first of all, thank y'all for inviting me. And um, I sit up here and I listen to everyone and with respect, you know, um, so just a couple of things that I would like to say, and I hope everybody just take it from, from a different perspective, right? Um, first of all, everybody knows about the collaborations, which was talking about collaborations are very important right now. Now, on the level of the gun violence in Philadelphia, I've lived in California, Florida, Maryland, DC, New York, and mentalities and personalities in the hood, are all similar. When we talk about 
AVP, and this is why I'm, I'm thankful for the collaboration that that I was blessed with by coming through with uh, uh, Penn Injury Science Center with Sarah Solomon, um, the, the district attorney's office with, un, with under the crisis response service for in the homicide division under uh, Myra, Myra Maxwell, also under AVP, under Natasha McGlynn, in um, which they do victim services and counseling. Uh, Ms. Kaufman, I really appreciate you again because you did a wonderful job at your presentation at our um, march and rally that we had a couple weeks, about a few weeks ago. So I appreciate you. Um, but I like to say, like, I hear the compassion in everybody, but this situation for us come with compassion and pain. I lost eight victims in my family to gun violence. My closest victim was my sister, my only sister. She was murdered in a home invasion in 2009. I had my mother's sister who was murdered in a, in a domestic situation years ago, who was my favorite aunt. I have a three-year-old grandnephew who was murdered by his father in a domestic situation where the guy, and he also tried to murder the mother, my niece as well as, but he killed himself. I had a cousin of a cousin who was murdered just recently in a domestic situation shot in the head. But when I talk about these issues, it's pain for me, but it ain't the pain that I had before. Now other people's pain is my pain. Other people's pain has become my pain. Every day that I'm out here, I cry every day of my life because this comes from five generations of inner city situations. It's five generations, but it's never none that been like it has been today. Every generation is worse than the last generation. And this, this is a fact. So when I talk, I talk about, I talk with compassion as well as pain. So every time when people come and they want to sit down, like the collaborators around me are the educated and, and, and these entities are, are successful. I'm grassroots. I'm from the muscle. I'm from the gut. I got to bring it how it needs to be bought. I was listening to a I was listening to a conversation on a radio Sunday. And in this conversation, and this is something that I say all the time, this, this, this here gun violence is vast. It's so vast, right, that it has to be updated continuously every day. Every situation has to be updated. When we talk about the domestic violence, how the women of women and children are being murdered now. I've never seen this like this a day in my life. It's a people problem. The people has to get involved. Years ago, when a woman or child was murdered, the penitentiaries sent word on the streets, find that killer. The streets shut down, find that killer. And the killer turned himself in. A lot of these youth have not been raised by good families, good homes, good situations. But, this, but, the, but it's deeper than that because we, like, when we sit up here and we talk about the problem is racism, poverty, education, uh, 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 jobs, right? That, that, that's a part of it, but it's deeper than that. It's way deeper than that. And a lot of times when, when, they, when they hear that these young men that's doing these murders are killing, the first thing they say is they, they, they take it to a mental, a mental health level. It's not always mental health. It's trauma and dysfunction. It's trauma and dysfunction. It's pain. So when we go ahead and we try to give them the things that, 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 that people think that they need, right by a job or something like this a job is no good it's null and void to these young to these youth and these young men ages 21 to 35 
A job is no good to them if you if you haven't reached their pain and their problem. Because the therapy is inside. A lot of times when people make their theories and, and, and things like this, they haven't listened to the person, to these people. One-on-one -on -one is not working anymore. Everything has to be done in an open forum because the children are killing the adults and the adults are killing the children now. So we always need, right? Like you can, you can, you can have the, the books and I, and, I, and I do respect the books, don't get me wrong. I do respect the theories, don't get me wrong. But like I said, it's more vast than that. But one thing that the books and the theories and the hypothesis and everything else can't do is update as fast as this stuff is happening. I can update it. People like me can update it as fast as it's happening because we know what it is. Like I said, I've seen five generations. When we look at these numbers, right, if that number right there, that's just an 11-day total of murders, which is 22 murders in 11 days. This is just this, this is the scenario. And when you look at this other, the other side, right? When you talk about the murders, like it's, it's 44 in, in January, 25, and, and, and as it fluctuates, one thing for sure that is not, one thing for sure is almost a murder a day. Some days it's four. And if I can remember when I was reading some, on some stuff, one of these months between the four and the six, seventh month, it had only one day. It was on the 18th that didn't have a murder. I'm sorry, I, I'm just boisterous, right? So please, like, just, just bear with me, right? Please bear with me, right? Um, I beg for collaborations. I beg for people to see it the way that, 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 the way that it's happening and stop looking at it on, 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 on one level of book sense and documentaries and things like this. Here. It has to be updated. We have to, like, it's, it's, it's many people in Philadelphia in all different situations, all different levels. A lot of people got situ uh, 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 solutions. And I'm not saying that the solutions are never, are never uh, 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 good solutions because they are validity in them. They are validity in them. I refuse, right, to keep hearing from the people when they say to me, they say, they say, they say, colleague, we love what you're doing and how you're doing it, but Please don't let them, don't let them, don't let us put us on a picture of mental health for everything or a theory for everything because that's, they feel violated and they don't want to give no answers. They don't want to give no answers. There's way that we can get answers together. And I, like I keep saying, we must come interracial in the faith. It has to be like that because in, in these communities, especially because we know where the inner cities where the crime is happening at. We know where it's happening at. In the African-American communities. I'm sorry to say this, but it's real. My goal, right, is to slow it down in the African-American community and try not to let it go to, 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 to any other communities like a pandemic. People think that the pandemic was holding things down. The pandemic didn't, did nothing to stop this here violence. The pandemic did nothing because people were still out there committing the murders. If you look at January, February, and March, we were still in the pandemic. And if you go back last year, you get the same number. We was in the pandemic. This problem can be tackled in a good way. I think that, I think that it's a lot of things like, like one of the things that the Beloved Care Project do. The Beloved Care Project brings Beloved care, not loving care, because love done played out for the people. They don't want. They don't want to hear "I love you" because "I love you" is just a cliche, man. It's just a. It's just a mad figure of speech right now. They need their love because these young men and women that's doing these killing. They don't know and believe in anybody no more because they can't believe in their own homes. They can't believe in their own neighborhoods. Because you know what, and I'm, and I'm hard on the men because the men left their families a long time ago and only made it worse because our old heads never treated us the way that these young boys and young girls are being treated. The women have a hard job too. But then, but then when we look at 
uh, at the music, when we look at the uh, uh, the social media, when we look at the uh, the the the, uh, the 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 reality shows, these are all the things that they copy off. A thirteen year old boy, his old head now is thirteen or eleven years old. It's the blind leading the blind. I go out in these cities, right? I do. This is what I, I I do. I do. I, everybody around me is 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 a, a safe haven on the inside. I have a safe haven too in the beloved care project, but it's bigger than the safe haven inside for me. It got to be a safe haven on the streets. If there's no safe haven on the street, how can there be a safe haven on the inside? So where do we start? We start the way that I know that for me, how I start, it's because I, I do, I do, I do rallies. I do rallies inside of the neighborhoods against gun violence. We don't match, we don't pick up no numbers because nobody's out there caring. I do rallies and, and then, I, then I then I go outside of my neighborhood to bring awareness to people that I know that the, the crime is about to, 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 to spread. I didn't did Rittenhouse, I didn't did Rittenhouse Square. I didn't did Marconi Park on Broad and Oregon. I didn't did Second and Brown. I didn't did Temple University. And let me tell you something, after doing Temple University, I caught a lot of pain when that man lost his life. I cried that night, all night long, because my conviction, I know is there. At the same token, everybody is responsible for somebody's life. I'm responsible for everybody's life in, my, in, in Philadelphia. That's how I look at it. That's the, that's the job I want to take on because I was of these streets. I was from these streets. I'd rather die with my life to save in these streets, the people in these streets, because the streets are not the problem, it's the people in the streets, than to die the way that I was living before. And when I, was, when I was in the street, I was a target. I didn't care about being a target because I was the man. And I was educated, yes. I got a car. I went to college. Yes, I, I, I had a 3.5 grade average. I come from a good family. I got street sense, common sense, and book sense. But I had a choice that I made on my own. These, these, these gun slingers now don't have a choice because if they're not ignorant, they're not cool. Right? Then we look at, then I do, then I do, and th this is why I do a, a, these rallies around the city because there's a call for support. We need support. Because there's strength in numbers, there's no numbers. Everything is on with people talking about here on this here session, this Zoom meeting, this is on. but where's the numbers? The numbers is what will make a difference because one thing for sure, the people that's having these problems, when they see some numbers and they see an interracial, they have hope. They need to have hope because they tired of hearing the hoopla, hoopla, hoopla of, 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 of what's going on, the, the politicians giving these hoopla, I'm sorry for your loss and things of this nature, right? You know what I mean? And people saying, I'm sorry for your loss. They're, they're tired of hearing, I'm sorry for your loss. Matter of fact, they're not even listening to that no more. It's about reaching them. Then I do, then I do things called listening to the children, listening to the teenagers. This is another event that I take all over the city. I, I, I want to try to put it in the school because I've spoken in school districts and, and I spoke on other, on other uh, uh, functions. But, but once you listen to the children and the teenagers and the young adults, you find out that they have the answers because they living in it. But first you have to build a trust and you have to build a trust that they can see the trust, but you got to bring someone in with you that they can trust. So when I walk in the door with the people, right, they already trust me, but they're going to trust the people because they feel like they're being saved by interracial, interfaith people. People that come in as doctors, lawyers, teachers, and things of this nature, because this is what have never been offered to them. They hear it on one level. Then we do, I do healing sessions. In my healing sessions, we do eight, week, eight to 10 week sessions. And what we do in these sessions is we, we, we bring out that pain in them. Therapists say, oh, no, that's not a good idea not to bring out the pain. You have to bring us out of our pain. You have to bring our children out of, out of their pain. 
You have to bring these young adults who's following behind these children because now the adults is not teaching the children. See, and I feel as though we got to work from the communities to get in the families. But when I came up, we worked from the families to get into the community. And that's how, and that's how things worked out better. But now we got to work from the communities to get to the family. And we deal with topics in this eight weeks, like a father in my life, a mother in my life, uh, uh, wait a minute, a father in my life, a mother in my life, uh, a, a mother's love for a child, no child left behind, crime is not an option, mental and suicide project, the importance of education, neighborhoods together, women are essential, respect for the elders, motivation for success, mental and physical abuse, and, and many more. And the reason why we tackle this out, these here, it's because see, when these children sit down in an open forum and they know that they are safe, because see, they're not doing the one-on-ones. You're not going to get nothing out of them like this. But when they sit down in these open forums and they hear from someone else when they talk about the effects of not having a father in their life or their father's been in prison or things of this nature, the first thing they do is they listen and they become relaxed. They become, then when, by the time you get to the second and the third, you start hearing the pain come out of them. And then they'll give you the answers about why, how they, who has the guns, where the guns from. They, they, they know somebody that has a gun. They, 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 all these, all this stuff will come out for us, right? So, and, and then, so, and then also we do the hill, hill assessment. But then, last thing I do, I do street monitoring. When I go to the sites where these victims are murdered at, and I go to these streets and I stay on these corners with signs showing support because they're not getting the support, but but they're afraid to come out. I just took this park from in our neighborhood and I'm turning that into a peace park. So, so because the, the people wanna see you doing some things, right? But they wanna see how it's coming and they wanna see it with, like I said, dear love and care because they don't have hope in that park yet until they see it's built. And I've used that park to have many rallies already. And they always watch from a distance. They never actually came to them. They came down the street or up the street, but they are there. This is when we was in Rittenhouse Square. This was before we collaborated with uh, uh, Myra, I mean, the, deal, the district attorney's office and the Penn Injury Science Center. This was the day when we had the, the shooting down there and they wanted to give a press, press conference, right? Things of trying to shut the city down for the state of emergency. Setting, setting it down for the state of emergency is very important, but, but, we got, but nobody's listening to us. So the numbers go up. And they go, now we collaborated with Dr. Myra. She's the one in the blue now from the district attorney's office. And that's the Tasha from the uh, Anti-Violence Partnership. And that's my, that's my old team. And those signs are the signs that I wear. This was an event that I did up 60th in, in, in Reinhardt trying to pull the neighborhood together because it's been so far that they have been, pulled, been together, right? People are getting this money, but they're not doing the work. I don't get paid for none of this. I do this. See, I don't put $40,000 of my money into this project, but I don't care because that's what I chose and I don't have a complaint. I don't, it's not about the money for me. It's about the support because he wants the support come, the job will be much more easier. This was Edison High School the week before the young man that was shot 18 times. And he was shot 18 times, 35 times. He went to the school. This was that week before. In that top corner is a group of young men in, 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 in the picture, in that corner. I had problems with them young men that day while we was down here, right? But after they, but after, after I sat and they talked and they listened, they wanted attention. That's all they wanted. There was real rowdy and rude and everything, but they wanted attention. And the next day we went down there, the young man, was he was the same way. He was rudy. And we had to calm him down, then his, then his, then his murder. This is what I know about listening to the children, because these are, these not even teenagers yet. I went down Malconi Park for awareness, a call for support. The parents never came over. And I have, I have gift cards, I have toys, I have, I have food, I have everything when I go out here. But the children rode around as they heard me talk. As they hear me talk, they sitting around watching. So I, so I said, you know what, let me just use my head, Kylie, and turn this into a, a youth rally and listen to the children at the same time. But I asked for permission from the parents. Can they, can they come and be a part? And if you see in the background, that's when you see the parents start coming apart. And we asking these here children, you can tell that they even know. The answer is because the little girl is holding the mic. She even said, I said, what, what do you think we could do? 
This is a nine-year-old child said we could do more protests. So like I've done the work, right? I want to do more work with everybody here and anybody that will have me, right? This here is, is for me, it's, it's, it's sincere. It's about conviction. Right now we had 221 murders. We left our last year at 499 murders. Again, I, I could tell you, we will see 460 to 470 murders before this year and now. Right now, we can't worry about the murders in December. We have to worry about what we need to do starting next year. And December is the time that we need to take this time out and, and, and figure out what we're going to do for next year. Because these murders now, they, once upon a time, they were all in the neighborhood. And then it was black on black in the African-American community, in the inner cities, in the Spanish communities, or wherever they were, in the poor, in the poor people communities, right? But now it's by any means necessary. This is why the young man was murdered by any means necessary, but we must bring awareness to the students, to the colleges, to the, to the grownups. We got to take this around and start bringing awareness because awareness is also going to be a deterrent for these, for these young people trying to commit these, these here things. So I thank y'all very much. If there's anything I missed, I'm sorry. You know, thank y'all for having me. Thank you, Khalif. Um, it's uh, hard to follow you as always. And thank you for sharing and all you're doing. Um, I'm going to wrap up the panelists discussion by talking a little bit about what are the opportunities from a policy perspective to address the gun violence crisis and I do not have a PowerPoint so apologies ahead of time here on that but it's great to be with everyone tonight. Uh, Ceasefire Pennsylvania is the state's gun violence prevention advocacy group and uh, we believe everyone should be able to live a life free from gun violence where they can thrive because they feel and are safe and as you've heard from all the panelists tonight really um you know when we think about what's driving this gun violence and then how to solve it there are two core elements that we're looking at from a policy perspective one is the continued and historic um, disinvestment in communities and drivers of violence through the trauma that individuals have experienced um, in those communities that are leading to these high rates of shootings in cities and uh, in the urban communities and have a hugely disproportionate impact on black and brown Pennsylvanians. And how do we heal that trauma and address them moving forward? Um, and two is how do we address firearm access itself? Because we know that the ease of access to firearms uh, both drives um, shootings and homicides that we see um, at high rates in places like Philadelphia and York and Pittsburgh and firearm suicide. Um, and I, I want to take one note on this. When you look at the highest rates of gun violence um, per capita in the counties in the Commonwealth, if you go back and you notice this on one of the maps that Ruth had early on, um, the highest rates of gun violence are in three counties, Philadelphia, Wayne County, right up along the New Jersey, New York border in the far Northeast and Fulton County. And the reason we see that is because uh, firearm suicide is a significant portion of gun violence in the state. About every nine hours, someone is, um, takes their life with a firearm um, and um, simple intervention mechanisms in that moment can save a life. Um, so we at Ceasefire PA are working with a coalition of organizations on a whole host of policies. I'm going to focus a little bit on the politics, a little bit on the hopeful side and then the challenges we face. Um, so hopeful piece first, because I feel like this has been informative, but sometimes can feel like an intractable you know, issue, is really where we are in investing on community in violence prevention programs, whether that's the work that Khalif does or the kind of neighborhood transformation work that Michelle talked about. Um, and um, these programs are really designed to address the trauma of communities to intervene and prevent the violence. And they look at a few different qualifications, but they really range in how they approach them. Um, they range from street outreach programs where you have credible messengers, maybe someone like Khalif who knows the nature of the violence, who knows where it's gonna happen and can step in before a shooting happens. Uh, I was talking to someone in Allentown the other day about this, who does this work up there, and someone was considering retaliating for a shooting. They were still in the hospital. And instead, they called her and said, because I'm talking to you, I'm not going to retaliate and shoot back. 
I'm going to heal, I'm going to learn, and I'm going to take a step. And that's a moment where you can intervene. And hopefully before you even get to that shooting itself. The second is ways to address those underlying questions of poverty and economic issues that drive a lot of the violence that we heard about. I mean, they range, but most notably workforce development programs are a good example. Um, Philadelphia is bringing in the READY program, which has been running in Chicago uh, to provide workforce development with behavioral cognitive therapy to uh, returning citizens who are coming out of the criminal justice system giving them other opportunities and skills, but then pairing that with that healing of the trauma they've experienced that we know how to drive the violence. Um, in general, these type of programs but, you know, are successful when they focus on uh, reducing violence by targeting highly, you know, populations of individuals at high risk for being involved in violence, um, when they heal the trauma people are experiencing um, through mechanisms like cognitive therapy and conversations engagement, like you heard Khalif talk about in the work of the Beloved Care Project, and three, where they help address those underlying drivers of violence, the economic issues and other pieces that are driving it. Um, and so they really range. And in Pennsylvania, we've had partners for years that have really done this work, often with no money, um, with pennies on the dollar, um, because they recognize the damage that's happening into the communities. Um, uh, in the last six months, the state and the city of Philadelphia combined have invested $50 million in violence prevention um, programs. And that money is starting to roll out, um, both from the city and the state. Um, it's a huge step forward. Other cities and states that have done this have seen gun violence drop 50 to 60%. Um, and really, it's about those strategies having the necessary resources to expand their programs. Um, and the exciting thing I think about this opportunity is that um, it was bipartisan, um, that we had strong support from folks like Senator Brown uh, in the Lehigh Valley who chairs the Appropriations Committee, um, as well as folks like Senator Hughes who really led the charge and is from Philadelphia obviously and is the minority chair of the Appropriations Committee. And they were able to work together in the state on this. And that is not the easiest thing to do in Harrisburg as people may know. Um, and at the same time, we need more resources. And so we're coming up on the start of a new budget cycle and the money did not go far enough. Even though it hasn't gotten out the door at the state level, they received $180 million in request on a $30 million bucket of money. Um, the city also received massively more than they could fund and also investing in local strategies with really deep ties to the community. And so we're working to make sure that we're looking at what that investment level should be to reduce violence by 30 or 40% in the next five years. And then two, um, what are the best ways for implementing that program and working with partners like Khalif and others in the city and the state to really bring together a coalition to address it. The second piece of the strategy on the policy level is really um, going to look different depending on the types of gun violence you're talking about. So we have primarily focused on homicides and shootings in places like Philadelphia. Um, but um, as I mentioned, we see high rates of gun suicide throughout the state. We're obviously paying attention to um, the horrific mass shootings in light of, again, what happened in Michigan, um, in Oxford the other week, uh, last week and more. Um, and the reality is that no matter how gun violence is impacting your community, wherever you live, the sense of loss of safety, the loss of your loved ones is a commonality between us that we need to recognize. And so we need different policy solutions, but we can recognize the damage it's doing to our community and to our lives and to our loved ones. And so we're, you know, at Ceasefire PA really focused on a, a common agenda of three policies that have been endorsed by about 140 organizations uh, to do this. Um, extreme risk protection orders, which just allows you to take away temporarily someone's firearm in your home who might want to hurt themselves or others, um, and have been shown to cut suicide by 17 to 20 percent. Uh, two is uh, reporting of lost or stolen firearms. Um, in Philadelphia, when we look at gun violence, a lot of that is being done with illegal firearms. Um, but every illegal firearm stolen or otherwise starts as a legal firearm, basically. And right now you don't have to report if that firearm is missing, if it was lost or it was stolen. And this is a loophole around our straw purchasing law uh, that is driving the trafficking of these weapons in communities and is 
you know, in one study in Pittsburgh found a third of crime guns the Pittsburgh police recovered were claimed to be lost or stolen. So by simply requiring the reporting, we can cut down on that trafficking and that access to firearms uh, for individuals who may want to hurt others. And then the last is universal background checks to close a hole in our system that allows you to buy a, pri a long gun like an assault weapon or other rifle from another individual, a private seller, without getting a background check. The reality is those are going to be hard, and I just want to be clear about this, to move in Harrisburg because of the politics in the state. The reality is that most Pennsylvanians um, and most people, you know, agree on these common solutions. These aren't radical, they're popular. They're not saying you can't have a firearm to go hunting or if you think you need it for protection. They're saying we're trying to save people's lives who might own them um, by preventing suicide, that we're trying to cut off the flow of illegal firearm trafficking that's driving the high rate of homicides, and that we're trying to invest in safer communities by helping those communities heal from the trauma and provide the support structures that we heard about earlier are so critical and changing the nature of that environment. Um, but in the Commonwealth, to be honest, um, that popularity of those issues doesn't always win out. Um, we saw the legislature pass a bill to allow anyone to carry a concealed firearm uh, just about three weeks ago now without getting a permit. And while it was vetoed, what we see is the extreme voices sometimes of individuals who um, think that any, any gun safety law, any reasonable protection to prevent access to firearms is, is unconstitutional and, uh, you know, and unacceptable. And that loudness of their voices, unfortunately, in politics went out. And I think that's really where the, you know, all of y'all are really critical in this discussion, because it's not enough to understand the nature of violence. That is a good starting point to understand the kind of solutions you've heard. Um, what we have to be able to do is to make it so clear that this majority of Pennsylvanians are not going to be silent, that we're sick and tired of living in a state of fear, where going to the grocery store, sitting on your stoop, or going to the park might be deadly, where you're waiting to get a call that your kid has to come home because there was a threat of a school shooting or, God forbid, something worse, and where you hear from a parent that they're 22 year old took his life with a firearm that they bought a few hours earlier as one of my um one of my friend's brothers did um and so what we need to do is make that clear and the public health community is really critical part of that narrative and i will drop a link in the chat in a second to get involved but the stories that you have and the understanding of this issue in a variety of ways and the trauma is going to be the thing that's going to ultimately make it so we can move these public policies forward. And I do firmly believe that. I mean, I will say this as clearly as possible. It can feel insurmountable, but like most things, it feels that way until we have success. Last year, or I guess still this year, last budget year, we won $50 million in funding by bringing these coalitions together. And now we need to get the common sense solutions together that will actually start to save lives. And as we chip away at these, we can have people who have less of the experiences that Khalifa has to have, that less of the experiences like my friend's uh, sister has to have. You know, those are the solutions we're looking for and how we move it forward at the end of the day. I wanna make sure, I'm gonna wrap up here because I wanna make sure there's time for questions. I'll note there's a lot of other public policies that we can talk about. Obviously safe storage is really in the news right now and children prevention of children access to firearms in light of what happened in Oxford. Um, but these common solutions are generally popular and will help cut the violence by keeping firearms out of those hands of those who wanna hurt themselves or others until they can get the support and help they need. And that's the goal and that's the mission that will prevent this trauma. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, the questions have been streaming in. So I am going to ask everyone to kind of rejoin us as a group uh, so I can go around and uh, get to some audience questions. So the first one is for Michelle, but others can also jump in. How long did crime rates remain low near the remediated lots? And has any follow-up been done with the lots that were remedi remediated to see if they remained in good condition or have reverted back to their original condition? Um, and if you could talk more about that, like greening and kind of this long follow-up. Yeah, so so this is really sort of the the limitation of this this study design that 
you know, we once the, the study is over that 38 month period, um, and we know we we allowed a, a sort of post intervention period, um, and I'm blanking right now on on what that was, but up to a year, um, I'm thinking. Uh, you know, after that, it was sort of like we, we couldn't, well, we had to ethically go in, uh, we had this responsibility to go in and treat the, the vacant lots, you know, the control lots uh, during study, we couldn't just leave them, um, given, you know, we knew the benefits to, uh, you know, of the intervention. Um, and so, uh, it's difficult really to follow over, you know, long term, what, you know, what, what are the impacts there. Um, but uh, I know that there are, you know, some interests and, and I think that in following this question and to doing the best we can at least to, to answer it, I don't have answers right now. That's okay. Sometimes we don't have answers. So <laughs> sometimes we're, we're working towards them, right? Uh, thank you. So we have a question around gun buyback programs. And for those in the audience who aren't aware, um, Pennsylvania has some preemption laws around who and what level of government can actually um, have laws around gun safety and gun control. So Pennsylvania, Harrisburg kind of maintains that. So looking at these greening lots or gun buyback programs to kind of address this issue uh, in a non-policy way. Could the group talk to gun buyback programs and if they decrease violence at all or kind of um, how and why those are used and what the impact is? I'm happy to start um, and then others can certainly chip in. So um, the traditional answer is no, gun buybacks have not been shown to significantly decrease firearm violence. And there are a number of reasons why you can imagine that might be true. Um, I will say that I've had some conversations with researchers about whether that's because we haven't done them right or whether we've kind of not done them to scale. Um, so what traditionally happens even in cities like Philadelphia is that gun buybacks are voluntary efforts often hosted by law enforcement between three and five on a work day every September, you know? And so the question is as to whether we would even expect that to reduce violence, I think the answer is probably not. But I think that there are people who feel that large scale mandatory, which is obviously controversial um, in a nation like ours, gun buybacks and returns um, that have been done in other countries have shown more promise um, they're just harder, I think, to operationalize. So I think it's an interesting question. And I think the shorthand answer of like, no, they don't work is probably a little under nuanced. There's probably more work to do to figure out how that can be a part of the solution, if not all of it. I'll chime in if it's all right and say, I agree um, with everything we said as always. Um, and that the person who's carrying a gun because they think they might need to use it, right? They're not bringing it to a gun buyback. Of course they're not. But if we pick up on what, what Adam was telling us and what is absolutely true, that every um, gun used in crime, almost every gun used in crime had a circuitous route to get there. Even if people are bringing in the guns that are sitting in grandma's drawer, right? That is a gun that is at risk of being used in a suicide or a homicide or an assault, you know? And, and decreasing that sort of ambient uh, quantity of guns that are out there has potential if it's at scale, like, like Ruth is saying. I also think there are probably some side benefits in that gun buybacks are an opportunity that we can take to bring people together to address this issue and to be confronting it head on. Uh, I think there's opportunity for conversation and connection, you know, kind of as a side benefit. So I'd be a little more optimistic uh, than um, sort of uh, the deck, the old older evidence on them. I'd like to say something about the gun buyback. I think that it's a good idea and we must continue doing it. But as long as we can continue doing it, see one of the things that we're not getting is the guns that they're using now. This is why we have to start reaching the ones with the guns so that we can make them put them down. Not make them, but let them get it, be able to put it down. Then you know that they have to surrender their lives to these guns in the streets. And I think picking up on all this, I agree with everything that was said. I mean, just to the scale problem, I don't have off the top of my head the Philly number. Like, I think I saw the other day that Philly said, the city of Philadelphia said in their gun buyback programs, maybe they bought back 800 firearms this year. 
I don't know the firearm sale numbers off the top of my head in Philly, but if 1.1 million guns were sold in Pennsylvania, surely a lot of those are in those areas. So at scale, we're just a drop in the, I mean, a really tiny drop in the bucket. I think one other interesting question to potentially explore in targeted buybacks, I think mandatory, as we said, would be great, but hard, um, is we have a lot of first-time gun owners right now. And the evidence is really clear that first-time gun owners are at much higher risk for violence. Um, there's just a study out of Rutgers actually um, looking at examining the characteristics of first-time gun owners from a shooting and homicide perspective, a community violence perspective. And there was a study early in the pandemic out of California that found that I think it, um, that men were, thir oh, I haven't looked in a while, 13 times more likely to commit suicide if they were first-time buyers and women were 35 times more likely. Um, and I'm curious in this moment where we've had these massive sales, if we targeted buybacks to first time owners who in the moment of the pandemic kind of panicked, if we could see some more targeted kind of reductions in both community violence and in suicide rates. Um, and I hope more studies come out about that. So there might be some particular ways. Uh, thank you so much. That's, um, you know, I think leaving off on that idea around impacting not just the community, but also suicide and kind of getting at these new vulnerable um, potential populations. So thank you. So we have a question. Um, most Black people's first language is AAVE, which is Amer uh, African American Vernacular English or Ebonics. Uh, it's not formal or proper English and certainly not academic jargon. For those of you who don't speak AAVE or Ebonics and aren't a part of the Black culture, how are you working to translate your messages so that people in the Black community are understanding and benefiting from your efforts? So I think it's a larger question around how we as academics are working with community members to make sure that our uh, research is accessible and comprehensive. Well, I could say that the bindings is something I never was a part of, right? Never approved of. But a lot of times we have to bring them back to old school ways and old school values, and old school speech. And a lot of times they, they, they more pay attention more to actions opposed to wording. And see what happened was a lot of the older people start being like the younger people. And this is where the problem came in at. So once you know we start changing our vocabulary the way when we talk to them, and it, it helps out a lot. I think that's a great question. Um, I'll just say briefly, for me, what it raises in the conversations I think we've had um, in my program is whether we should even always be the ones talking um, and whether there are better messengers that have greater knowledge of some of the issues that we're confronting and that are um, better ambassadors um, both in both directions, kind of so that health can learn and so that uh, community can learn so that we can have kind of these areas of shared learning. Yeah, and I'll, I'll pick up on it quickly. I mean, on the advocacy side, I mean, I think partially it's about listening and getting that feedback and really sitting down and taking the time to hear the communities and be, you know, as best we can listen to, um, employ, work with closely. I think for us, you know, I'll say two things. One, I think there's like a research problem writ large. Some researchers, no offense, are better and worse about this. Like, just in general within the public sphere, like, how do we communicate the powerful work that Michelle has done in a way that people can engage and understand the impacts of it, right? And I think that's just generally important. And then within the context of this conversation, a lot of our work is um, the advocacy world can feel confusing and complicated and hard to engage in. And so we try to um, simplify that process by making it easier for the you know community members to be heard and have that ability to engage in their authentic voice. And so a lot of it is like, here's what's happening in Harrisburg. Here's like the story. Now share your voice on it as you want to be seen and heard. And so I think that's another place where we can do more of that. Great. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question here around the illegal gun trade and uh, thinking about some of that gun safety legislation or some of the stuff that Michelle was talking about with greening spaces and cleaning up environments, have we found legislation that impacts the illegal gun trade or any other measures that can have an impact? Ruth, I'll please go ahead. First, <laughs> I'll, I'll share in after. 
I'm hoping that there's like a, a speaker in Harrisburg that's listening to what we're saying right now. Yes, there is legislation that could impact the illegal gun trade. Um, and it's been demonstrated to work in other states throughout the country. Um, I'll highlight one policy just for the sake of time, permit to purchase, which is basically the idea that many people actually think exists when you talk to them about it and are shocked to find that it doesn't exist, that you would get a permit in advance of buying a gun. Um, and that allows a number of different things. It reduces a number types of violence. It's showing preliminary promise, even in reducing um, uh, violence against and by law enforcement and domestic violence and you name it, community violence, potentially suicide, because it creates another check, right? It creates a little bit of time um, for reasonable minds to prevail. Um, and it's been shown to, to be an effective kind of policy to reduce violence very practically by significant amounts and even specifically in urban counties like ours. So I'll look that one up. And I think just adding to it and permit to purchase is a great example. You know, one of the things we know is a lot of the firearms are, you know, again, lost or stolen. And so mechanisms that secure your firearm, safe storage, right? Lots of firearms that are used in this in, um, you know, um, shootings are stolen out of cars, for example, right? So securing the firearm, whether both through safe storage laws that require and encourage that process, um, as well as um, requiring the reporting of loss or stolen, reduce it. So, um, you know, New Jersey has such a law and they found that um, the trafficking of lost or stolen weapons that were then appearing at crime scenes in other states dropped by 40% once they passed the lost and stolen law. And that's a pretty significant drop and Pennsylvania is in the top 10 list for kind of exporting guns basically as we saw in one of those earlier slides. And so I think securing the firearm, knowing where it is and permit to purchase is a perfect and really the final part of that process, you know, the initial but the largest part of that process will address that problem greatly. And just to bring it back to um, where we started to say, um, in addition to all these policies that are focused specifically on the firearm, the work that we need to be doing that's focused on the, the root causes of violence and the things that lead people to feel that they need to have a firearm, that they need to carry a firearm, that they're uh, unsafe without one, that you know, all of the opportunities that serve as the antidote to violence, right? All of those policies affect the, um, that trade as well. Um, so it's all of a piece. There is no real, the dichotomy between legal and illegal is false here. It really all does go together. Can I ask a question, please? Well, not a question, but just to have a topic. You know, one of the things I've seen we got on the gun topic again, right, about the guns, but we know that they've been fighting with these guns for many, many, many years. And, 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 and these gun people always win. But at the end of the day, when we look at it, the more of an issue is the people that have the guns, right? And that's one of the biggest focus, right, to me, right? Then also, not only is that the biggest focus, but now these streets have, they don't need the gun, the gun lobbyists anymore, all these people, because they have ghost guns that they commit a lot of these murders in these cities with now. And these ghost guns are supposed to be made off a computer or something like that, where I don't know, I don't know much about them, but I've been hearing a lot about them from the streets. Yeah, ghost guns are just a, they're firearms you can build in your home, usually takes an hour or two, it's often two pieces of metal you can order online, put them together, drill a few holes, and you have a firearm. They don't get classified under the law as firearms, so you don't need background checks. And I haven't seen the latest statistics, but the since Philadelphia police, who one of the few police departments that are currently tracking them, are finding them at increasing rates at, at shootings, at much, much more increasing rates, and it's because um, anyone can order them online and put them together. And there's a rulemaking at the federal level that ATF has um, that we hope the Biden administration will finalize soon to treat them like any other firearm. Um, at the same time, the attorney general's in court um, waiting for a ruling on, he, he, he classified them under law as firearms and was sued over it. And so we're waiting for that process to move forward. Thank you, because you brought up one of the questions around if uh, ghost guns were kind of overhyped in crimes or not. And so I, I think that we've answered that one thinking about does any do any of the panels know how often they're being used, if it's uh, more talk 
or or is there a real concern behind that? Um, I don't know if anyone can speak to that. I don't have the numbers offhand, but in the name of prevention, I'll say that the rate of rise is what's particularly important. So there's still not a majority of the guns that are recovered in crime by any means, but the rate at which they are increasing, if you compare the number recovered this year to the number recovered in the previous year, um, if we were to contin continue with that trajectory, we'd have a serious problem, problem on our hands. So in the name of kind of getting ahead of the issue and prevention, definitely a reason to kind of act very quickly if people are able to assemble firearms in their living rooms. Um, I was wondering if the panelists could speak to some of the uh, mental health that came, seems to be being brought up. And Dr. Bai, you brought it up in the question and answer around like demand, um, Dr. Kaufman brought it up. So, you know, uh, there was a discussion around suffering and loss and pain and this, intergenerational trauma and community trauma. So I was wondering if the group could speak to gun violence more from this trauma lens and how we can be healing communities since we know that gun violence that's happening today will have a multi-year lasting impact um, in communities, in retaliation, in spikes in crime. So if the group could kind of talk, um, I, I ask this to everyone, across that, that idea of how we address trauma, how we think about this, in the years to come, since we are having such high rates right now? You know, one of the points that I brought in this topic, right, was about the mental health, how everything is labeled mental health, right? Our children in, 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 in inner cities, and I'm talking about California, Florida, Maryland, everything, a lot of these children have been forced to have been diagnosed as mental health because nobody ever took the time to listen to their pain. Like I, I, keep, I keep iterating this here. And I'm telling you, if somebody just take the chance, come to one of my sessions one day, please come to one of my, my healing sessions one day. And you listen, these are children who have been through the system of the streets, of this gun violence and everything else. Sometimes it's, it's disrespectful to label everything under mental health. A lot of these children don't have, it's the pain. Trauma and dysfunction is not mental health. Trauma and dysfunction, right, is, is, is heredity and things that we go through in life. Trauma, I'm, I'm going to give you a perfect example of trauma real quick. When a child is in school and then he finds out that the school that he went to has closed down so that they can build a condominium, that's trauma. When a child go to school and there's 25 students in the, in, the, in, the, in the, those, those little things like trauma, and there's and 25 students and there's 18 new books, and seven students not going to get a new book. That's trauma. Little things like that is trauma. And then there are also other levels of trauma. I definitely want to second that. I think that that's spot on. I'll say that when I think about things from my clinical hat, you know, you, you, you're not going to get the right resolution if you don't have the right diagnosis. And so um, I think that there are serious concerns being raised nationwide about what people who come into, for example, my setting, the emergency department with behavioral issues are labeled as and whether or not we're just mischaracterizing um, their needs and therefore applying the wrong medicine as it were, the wrong solutions to the problem. And then those problems go untreated. You know, I'm seeing them when they have an outburst at school at seven years of age. And then I'm seeing them, or you know, in worst case scenario, Dr. Kaufman seeing them a few years later in her trauma bay. And so, are we not? Are we missing a link there because we put the wrong diagnosis down? Um, so I think that you know, there are great there are great analogies for this in in the medical world. We need to think about whether or not we actually have the right diagnosis. Or are kids traumatized and chronically disadvantaged, and we haven't labeled it properly? And so we're not we're not applying the right medicine to it. Um, can I say one more thing? We talk about ther this, this therapy. When they start diagnosing these children and these adults, right? It's a dictation. This is your problem. This is your problem. This is what's going on in your life. It's a dictation because you take one sentence or something that that child might be going to and you dictate. That's why it's called listening. See, we were listened to. I didn't turn out to be a bad man, but our, pe our families listened to us. One thing about it, like, I can't tell, and I had a conversation earlier with someone about this here. Don't tell me about the African-American community. 
because I lived it. I can't tell you about uh, the Spanish. I can tell you a little about the Spanish community because we have a connection, but I can't tell you about an Irish person's uh, community and, and, and their upbringing. I can't tell you about a Jewish person's community upbringing, but I have to listen to learn. A lot of times we just be, we be, we be, uh, 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 sucks. I can't think of the word. Whereas though, we're just like, I'm going to depict this from this person because this is what their house looks like, or this is what they're to, or this is what they're doing, and this is what we become in our inner cities. This is a concern. That's pain. We want to be heard. We want to be listened to. They, these children want to be listened to, not we. I already know how what made me a, a, a better person in my life. I know it made my children and my grandchildren better people. I got a six-year-old grandson that every day I worry about him being the next, the next murderer or victim of murder. If I don't, if I don't, if I don't hold on to him the right way. Thank you all for expanding on that and making us really think about how we diagnose and think about these issues um, in a more holistic way. And when we think about the scars left from uh, gun violence, whether it be suicide, community violence, mass shootings that have rippled through, we've seen schools being shut down. Can we talk about how to bring together, this is clearly a Philadelphia problem, but also a Pennsylvania problem, um, as Adam brought up, looking at where gun violence rates are. It's not just in Philadelphia. We're seeing spikes across the state, and we're not always accounting for suicide. So could each of the panelists talk about how we come together as a commonwealth? to address this issue, to kind of bridge those gaps and get to what you're talking about, Khalif, around talking and listening and kind of sharing in the collective pain and how to, to move forward and think about the solution as, as Pennsylvanians. Let's start with, right, the collaboration for the good of what, 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 we can, what I can bring and what people who is in my situation through generation can bring. Right, the ones that are sincere, see, because it got to be a sincerity, got to be some loyalty, integrity involved in this here, right? And then once we start doing that, right, allow yourself to say, don't don't bring everything out of books, because bring 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 fifty percent of you and, and let me take fifty percent of me, and let's come together, and then we can weigh the facts and and, and the differences, and then we can come up with a solution together, right? And, but we definitely, we definitely need it in numbers and support. And the collaborations is the most important part and we got to listen to them. I don't know if Michelle could talk to some of the collaborations because it's really interesting to think about the USDA and having these groups come together to kind of address gun violence and think about how we can bring together partners uh, across the Commonwealth to talk about this issue. Sure, uh, well, you know, I, I wear multiple hats. And so bringing in people across world, uh, world, right? Some, sometimes it's like parallel universe. Um, so, you know, bringing together public, the public health side, you know, with the parks managers and the landowners and the, um, you know, the, and the, envi the environment side, the ecosystem folks and, um, who are just thinking about different dimensions of, of space and, and neighborhoods and people and social issues and you know what's driving this and that. Um, yeah, at, I mean, so much of, of my work is, is um, bringing those two um, worlds together. And, 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 and lastly, what we gotta do as, when I tell you how we collaborate in the racial interface, we have to bring it into the churches, into the masters, into the synagogues. We got to bring it to the schools. We got to bring it into prisons. We got to bring it to the workplaces. We got to bring it into to every place that they are that they are people who need to listen. The ones with families, the ones with our families, the one with children that need help, and the children that want their parents to get help also. So we got to go on levels because we keep blaming politicians, the police, and this person. No, nah, man, I'm tired of hearing people pointing a finger. It's a people problem. And if we come together as a people, then all those who don't conform to it will conform hopefully. I'll just, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Christian. 
Well, I was going to, I mean, I'll give you, I'll give my political, hard nosed political answer and then my organizing answer. My hard nosed political answer is that sadly, those of us that live in Philadelphia have much less of a voice on statewide policy than we should. That, you know, I just want to be brutally honest here. I live in South Philly. Like, if our elected officials were in charge, we'd have a lot less problems in this regard and probably other issues. Um, and that the onus on us then has to be one. Um, to get other communities to connect to the violence and the suffering we're having here by recognizing how it's impacting their community, but I think also just recognizing the humanity within it all. Um, and so that means that it's not, to be honest, from a statewide perspective, that helpful to organize in the city of Philadelphia. We know about city level efforts. And as we mentioned, there's preemptions, a real challenge around that. And we and the city and others are suing the state over that. But I think the reality is, communicating what's happening here, both with other cities like York, like Reading, like Erie, and connecting it with the suicide pieces are gonna be key. And we need to recognize that that requires us to connect with our friends and our people we don't know in those communities. And that kind of gets me to my organizing answer, which is I think most people are with us and they have different experiences with violence. And I think when we have these conversations, it does connect, right? So. Uh, my example is, and it's, uh, I have some friends down in Georgia where I was born and raised. I will tell you, two of them I don't agree uh, with on firearms safety at all. One of them, I have to admit, sells ghost guns. Um, but I was sharing my like safe storage op-ed today with one of them and about this ideal of like parents being held accountable when they don't store their firearms safely, and they both agree with that. And I think when we talk to gun owners and we talk to people and we make those conversations, since most people agree with us, we can move them into the space, but we have to have those conversations in a really honest and approachable way. And we have to do it with folks outside of, you know, our kind of area just because of the brutal politics of the matter. Can I also just say, um, I think part of it is also grappling with a very uncomfortable history around race and why we talk about different types of firearm related problems with different levels of urgency and in different ways. Um, and that that contributes to why we use different tools to solve different types of firearm injury and death. And so I think there also has to be a very honest conversation around race in Pennsylvania and how that manifests as different levels of concern about community violence. Excellent point. Um, thank you so much for, for raising that. I think it is it is absolutely true that we do not address the issue on similar grounds based off of um, race. So there is a qu one more question, and I think this will probably be our last one as we're coming near 6.30. And I really wanna thank all the panelists uh, for everyone who's still with us in the audience, what happens when we finish out and it closes down, we just kind of all disappear. So I want to take a moment to just thank everybody for sharing their time, their expertise, um, and coming together on this really important topic. So we'll go out on a question that was in the uh, in the Q&A box that says, I've read some people calling for the governor and mayor to declare a state of emergency in Philadelphia due to gun violence but they are refusing to do so. And what would a state of emergency do for this issue? Why is it important or not important? If the group could maybe talk about, you know, we've talked about some long-term strategies, but maybe some immediate strategies around how to grapple with um, uh, the loss that we are seeing. You know, it's funny to talk about that, but it goes back to the saying that there's no support in numbers because Look at what the, look what happened with the agents when they start going through what they were going through with the harassment thing. They came together in numbers and they got some things done. These was the way, as long as you run down on City Hall and these and, and all these all these politicians in numbers, see, they're not seeing numbers when it comes to this gun violence and rallies and events or anything. Right? When the Black Lives Matter came, they came with numbers. That's how they got some, some things done. Numbers work because they don't want to see that in front of their doors. When they're doing this, all this gender firing in Philadelphia, and I keep saying, I'm from South Philadelphia, and I see the gender firing coming on. Like I keep telling the people, they shouldn't have to come into a, a, a neighborhood where they buy million dollar houses there, and they suffering through this gun violence without going down there in numbers and complaining about, 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 about fixing this situation, because they should have took care of the situation before they start building these houses and bring these people in here to become victims. So we need numbers, and we got to roll with numbers. Numbers, old school methods, but 
You know what I mean? Instead of these new school ways, the people that got lazy and, and, and they say desensitized, but it's not desensitized. It's laziness, and, and I got to say it in other words, it's laziness and, and being and ignorant. I don't think that anybody needs um, a declaration of a state of emergency that's an empty statement that doesn't bring resources, doesn't bring real attention, doesn't bring policy change to the problem. Um, but I do think that we could do more to recognize, just not to declare a state of emergency, but just to see the emergency that communities are suffering in Philadelphia and have been suffering in Philadelphia and will continue to suffer in Philadelphia. I think we've, um, we've seen some really amazing progress in terms of bringing some of the resources that are needed to help individuals and to help communities heal. And, but as, uh, as Adam laid out for us in terms of the numbers earlier, it's nowhere near enough. Um, and if it were up to me, we'd shut everything else down until we fix this. I don't think that's what declaring a state of emergency would do, but we can dream. I mean, I, we have called for the, the mayor to declare a state of emergency and the governor. I think we get caught up a little bit in what does that mean within the context? And it is a little unclear within the context of some additional resources and pieces. To me, it's too, I mean, one, we are just in a state of emergency, I think from this conversation, like let's all just own that. But I think that um, there is the mental signal it sends and we can see impacts from other campaigns by doing that, that it can have an impact in how we approach it. And I think there have been um, critiques that I think are sometimes valid and I have a ton of respect for Ruth and the work she does that the city has not always and that the leadership has not always at certain levels brought the attention and the resources or the focus on this issue. Um, and I think it's been a challenging time for sure. And so I think there's a question of that and the way we approach it and what impact that could have. It's a little less clear short of the National Guard, whether it would bring much more resources, but I think there might be some mental and emotional impacts that would be very valuable in addressing this crisis until we can get more policies in place and other resources. I'm gonna say this here, this 520 something murders right now, right? And, but like I said, by the end of the year, we'd be at 560 or 570. And if people don't think that's an emergency, then it's a problem. The murder, this, this thing is hitting center city where people is eating and areas. Listen, everybody that lives in Philadelphia within a one mile radius of their home is in danger. And that's the reality. And if it get worse, before. Listen, it hasn't gotten no better. It hasn't gotten no better. Even with all the money that they didn't put out, it hasn't gotten no better. And you should be scared. You should be afraid to drive, to walk out your door. But without awareness, it's like, if it's not me, it don't affect me, then why should I worry about it? Thank you all for your tremendous uh, presentations and comments and thanks to the audience for um, your very engaging questions um, that have pr prompted, I think we could probably talk about this all night long. Um, but as uh, an emergency physician, as a public health person, as a mother and as a Philadelphian, I can say in so many ways, um, it's true, it feels scary at times and it feels insurmountable, but um, I'm tremendously humbled and so, so grateful by your expertise and your dedication to addressing these issues. Um, we have so much to learn from each and every one of you. And I think the biggest lesson out of this is how critically important it is to do just the basic things like stopping to listen to each other and really trying to understand um, how this affects all of us, whether or not we see it or we feel that we see it right in our everyday, um, but also how very, very important it is for all of us to be involved in some way. And whether that's sharing information that we've learned, sharing perspectives, 
um, or and especially um, going to vote and making sure that our voices are heard on our city level and our state level, even if as Philadelphians, we may be outnumbered on the state level, it is exceptionally important for us to put the people in all of those spots to be able to reflect the voices that we have and the perspectives we have and share our values to make sure that the resources are shared appropriately. So thank you again. Thanks to all the audience members who have stayed with us. Um, panelists, speakers, again, my utmost respect and um, just unending gratefulness for everything you do. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the, the last public health grand rounds of 2021.